This is Michael Altos recording Local Anesthetics, Part 1. Local anesthetics are able to take away the sense of pain and vibration and light touch. They can also impede transmission of signals that allow for motor action of muscles, and they can even block nerves that transmit autonomic function. The common mechanism for blocking the action of nerves with local anesthetics can be understood once we review the physiology of the cell membrane. Remember that a cell has a resting electric potential, and this potential is generated due to a protein called the sodium-potassium ATPase pump. This pump uses energy in the form of ATP to pump potassium into the cell and sodium out of the, out of the cell. And this creates a certain potential across the membrane, which we call the resting potential. Now there are sodium and potassium channels that are voltage gated so that when a charge propagates along the cell, it will depolarize the membrane. And this is called an action potential. Local anesthetics will enter the cell and actually bind to these sodium channels. They'll bind to the voltage-gated sodium channels on the inside of the cell. And when they do that, they prevent the influx of sodium and they slow conduction across the nerve cell. There may be secondary mechanisms whereby local anesthetics bind to other ion channels as well. But there's no question that the primary action is binding to sodium channels on the inside of the cell. Now we're going to talk about the different nerve fibers that exist in physiology. And this is a very complicated subject, but we're going to try to keep it as simple and basic as possible. In general, there are three kinds of nerve fibers. The biggest, thickest, fastest fibers are called A fibers, which are typically found to be transmitting motor and pressure sensation and proprioception. Skipping over the A deltas for a moment, the B fibers are medium size and transmit at medium speeds, typically transmitting some autonomic uh, signals. <clears throat> and the C fibers, which I have in bold, are the smallest and the slowest transmitting fibers. These are your pain fibers, which as anesthesia providers we are interested in being able to control. I've highlighted the A delta fibers because while A fibers are thick, the A-delta fibers tend to be more like C-fibers. They're smaller and slower, and they also transmit pain. The phenomenon that we're trying to get at is what's called a differential block, the idea that different nerve fibers get blocked more or less easily when exposed to local anesthetic. And we typically find that the autonomic fibers are the first to get blocked, followed then by sensory block, and only then does motor block occur. Recovery occurs in the opposite direction. The nerves that were hardest to block and were blocked last are the first to recover. And so the block recedes in the opposite direction. And this is the phenomenon of differential block. Let's start by looking at the anatomy of a nerve. We know a nerve is made of axons, which are individual nerve fibers surrounded by endoneurium. The axons are then bundled into fascicles, which are surrounded by perineurium. And finally, together they come to make nerves, which are surrounded by epineurium. And here's a picture of different axons. This axon has C fibers. This axon has A fibers. Each axon is surrounded by myelin. The axons are bundled together into fascicles. Each axon is surrounded by endoneurium, and the fascicles are surrounded by perineurium. And finally, the fascicles together come to make a nerve surrounded by epineurium. Axons are surrounded by a substance called myelin. Myelin is thought to be like an insulating substance. But there's a misconception that there are myelinated and unmyelinated fibers, and that the myelinated fibers are surrounded by myelin, and the unmyelinated fibers have none. This is not exactly true. In fact, here we have a Schwann cell which makes the myelin and the unmyelinated fibers are still surrounded by myelin but just not very tightly wrapped. 
So these axons are loosely surrounded by myelin, and they're called unmyelinated. The myelinated axons are surrounded by layer upon layer of myelin. Classically, people thought that the local anesthetic had to sort of fight its way through the myelin. And that was why we thought that maybe myelinated axons, which were surrounded by layers and layers of myelin, were harder to block than unmyelinated fibers, which actually are also surrounded by myelin, but as you can see, much less wrapped up. It turns out that this isn't really how local anesthetics work. They don't fight their way through the myelin, but they find these nodes, they find these gaps between the myelin, and that's where they act. And it turns out that as a result, the myelinated fibers, which have these gaps, may actually be more sensitive to local anesthetics than the non-myelinated fibers, which don't have these gaps. And in Miller's textbook, for example, he addresses this misconception. And he says the generalized notion that local anesthetics block the smallest fibers first or most is clearly wrong. And I think this is where people start to get a little bit confused. And so I wanted to summarize this in a digestible piece of information that you can write down and you can memorize and take as a good rule of thumb to keep um, when asked these questions on exams. So in general, our small fibers are more susceptible than large fibers. That's just a function of the thickness of the fiber. And we expect that local anesthetics will have a harder time penetrating a thick fiber than a thin fiber. Myelinated fibers are actually more susceptible than non-myelinated fibers. And so practically we get this differential block which starts not with just the thinnest fibers and not just with the non-myelinated fibers, but with a combination. And so our differential block usually starts with B fibers, which tend to be autonomic, and a little bit of C, and then more of the C and A fibers, which are sensory, and finally the thickest A fibers, which are motor, are the hardest to block. And then within sensation, we find that temperature is usually the first thing to get blocked, and then pain, and then as we get to things like touch and deep pressure, deep pressure and proprioception, which are transmitted by thicker fibers, these become a little bit harder to block within the spectrum of sensory blockade. Take a few minutes to digest that material and take note of any questions, and we're going to move on. Here's an atomic structure of lidocaine, molecular structure of lidocaine, as an example of a local anesthetic. All of our local anesthetics have in common a lipophilic side, which is some sort of a benzene ring in lidocaine, a hydrophilic side, which is an amine, and then a linkage group, which is usually an ester or an amide. In lidocaine, it's an amide. All local anesthetics are weak bases. I told you that this material we learned in the first week would come back and be important, and here it is. So you just need to know that Molecularly, local anesthetics are weak bases, which means, as you know, that the species can accept a proton and become positively charged. Now, the protonated species is more potent because if it's going to bind to a sodium receptor, we expect that it will be positively charged like sodium. And indeed, the protonated species is the active species that binds to the channel. The pKa of these drugs tends to be somewhere in the uh, low 8, low to mid 8 range, depending on whether it's an amide or an ester. Now the onset of action of a drug depends, first of all, on its ability to penetrate membranes. So before it becomes charged, we would ideally want the drug to be uncharged, so it can slide through the lipophilic membrane. And as molecules get charged and larger, it becomes harder to slide through the membrane. Once it has crossed the membrane, we would prefer to have the molecule become charged. And the more charged species there are, the better the local anesthetic will work. And so we will see that an acid environment inside the cell, well let's back up, an acid environment outside the cell will cause the species to be charged. It will push that equation to the right. It will be harder for the species to cross the membrane and onset will be slower. That's why we add bicarbonate to a local anesthetic solution in order to speed up onset, because it pushes the equation to the left, 
the base is uncharged and it easily crosses the membrane. Just a clinical note, we do add bicarbonate to lidocaine regularly, but if you ever try adding it to bupivacaine, you will probably find that a very small amount of bicarbonate will cause your bupivacaine solution to precipitate. The density of the block, how deep is the block, depends mostly on the concentration of drug that you've applied. You need enough drug to saturate binding sites and prevent any transmission of action potentials across the nerve. And it also depends on volume because you need to block a certain length of fiber. You can't just block one tiny spot of fiber, but you want to block a certain length so the action potentials are completely prevented from being transmitted. The duration of action of a local anesthetic usually correlates with its lipid solubility because the local anesthetic has to diffuse away from the nerve and then into the bloodstream to be metabolized. Here's a nice diagram of a local anesthetic and a cell membrane. So above we have the outside of the cell and below we have the inside of the cell. Here's our lipid bilayer membrane. This N and NH+, this is our local anesthetic. We said it's a base, so it can accept a proton to become charged and we see that the charged species cannot really cross the lipid bilayer very easily. But when it becomes uncharged in a non-acidic solution, or if we add bicarbonate, then it easily crosses the membrane. Once it crosses the membrane, we would like it to become charged again. And when that happens, it can bind to this sodium receptor from the inside and prevent depolarization. Notice that when it's charged, it has a hard time escaping from the cell this is a phenomenon known as ion trapping. Take a few minutes to consider any questions you may have, and then we will move on. Now, absorption of local anesthetics is something we need to consider, because usually we want our local anesthetics to be applied to a specific uh, cell or nerve or anatomic structure and we don't really want it to be applied to the bloodstream and the whole body. There are exceptions but usually that's not what we want. So we need to be aware that our local anesthetics are rapidly absorbed through mucous membranes like the eyes, the trachea, the oropharynx, although they are poorly absorbed through intact skin. So the inside of the mouth or the urogenital tract you will have good absorption, but outside the mouth on the skin, you will have poor absorption. In fact, if you do want to apply topical anesthetic to the skin, there's something called emlocrine. You may see that used in pediatrics from time to time. Emla stands for eutectic mixture of local anesthetics. And it's a mixture of, I think, prilocaine and benzocaine, if I remember correctly. Uh, it takes about an hour to work. It only penetrates about three to five millimeters into the skin. And if you use way too much of it, you will actually run the risk of uh, causing methemoglobinemia, which is something we'll speak about a little bit later on. So emlocrine is sometimes used in anticipation of IV starts for children. But as you can see, it needs to be applied judiciously um, and it needs to be applied with enough advanced time. How much local anesthetic is absorbed when you inject it? It depends a lot on how vascular the area is. So if you would inject local anesthetic into an area of the body that has poor circulation, there's not much risk of absorption of local anesthetic into the circulation. But an area that is very richly vascular is much more likely to absorb the injected local anesthetic into the systemic circulation. So obviously, IV injection is the most vascular of all. After that, as we apply local anesthetic to the trachea or in the intercostal space where those nerves are right next to blood vessels, we have a pretty high risk of developing um, local anesthetic, anesthetic absorption. And as we move down this spectrum, we finally get to subcutaneous, which is much more poorly vascularized, and the risk of developing local anesthetic absorption into the systemic bloodstream is much lower with a subcutaneous or even a peripheral nerve uh, administration. 
we can decrease the risk of local anesthetic being absorbed into the bloodstream by causing vasoconstriction of the blood vessels in the area. And we do this by adding epinephrine to our local anesthetic solution. When we add epinephrine, the blood vessels are vasoconstricted, systemic absorption is slower, and this gives more time for the local anesthetic to be taken up into the neuron. Redistribution away from the neuron into the bloodstream is slower, and this makes your local anesthetic have a longer duration of action. This effect is not quite as pronounced with bupivacaine, although we certainly do still add epinephrine to bupivacaine. Classically, we are taught not to add epinephrine to local anesthetic that will be applied to terminal parts of the body. The classic mnemonic is fingers, toes, penis, nose. Anything that we wouldn't want to have decreased blood flow and possibly risk becoming ischemic or necrotic. There is one local anesthetic that causes vasoconstriction without the need for epinephrine, and that local anesthetic is cocaine. And you will see that used sometimes in uh, ENT or neurosurgery rooms where they are going to be operating through the nose. And they will apply cocaine to the inside mucosa of the nose in order to cause vasoconstriction and decreased bleeding. As far as metabolism and excretion, the ester local anesthetics, like chloroprocaine, novocaine, and tetracaine, all undergo rapid metabolism by pseudocholinesterase, the same enzyme responsible for metabolism of succinylcholine. This is a form of ester hydrolysis, and the byproducts are excreted in the urine. <clears throat> there is no pseudocholinesterase in the CSF, incidentally, which is why some esters, like tetracaine, can provide a very long spinal anesthetic until the drug slowly diffuses out of the spinal fluid into the general circulation. As we will discuss later, esters are metabolized into a byproduct called PABA, para-aminobenzoic acid, and this can lead to an allergic reaction, and we'll discuss this a little bit later. Cocaine is unique amongst the esters in that it undergoes some metabolism in the liver. The amide local anesthetics, lidocaine, bupivacaine, ropivacaine, and others, are all metabolized in the liver, and this, product, pro, this process is much slower than the metabolism of esters, and these are thought to be longer-acting local anesthetics for that reason. We'll stop here. Let me know if you have any questions, or please bring them to class, and we'll pick up again with the next video.